I want to start by suggesting we begin by giving thanks to God for in clicking on this episode, you, like us, want to get more out of prayer by giving of yourself more. That is a grace, and we should be men of thankfulness. You understand that your prayer can be more, much more, but things keep getting in the way. We discuss the obstacles to prayer and some principles to keep in mind to improve your prayer life today. Stay with us. Welcome to the Catholic Gentleman Podcast. We are your hosts, Sam Griezmann and John Heinen. And today we are here to talk about another Lenten discipline and really a discipline that should be with us throughout our lives, and that is prayer. Um, Last week we talked about fasting. Um, This week we're going to talk about prayer, some of the pitfalls and challenges that we might face in our prayer lives. Um but also how we can answer uh, the call of St. Paul in Scripture to pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. Um, But before we get there, we just want to thank all the donors who make this episode possible. Um, It isn't uh, cheap, actually, to produce quality content like this. Um, We love doing it. Uh, Our hearts are in it, uh, 100%. Um, But there are a lot of uh, hidden costs involved that you wouldn't (laughs) expect in producing a high-quality podcast. So, just if you feel led this Lent and your Lenten almsgiving to support the Catholic gentleman, uh, please consider a donation or joining us on our Patreon community um, with many other men like you who uh, are supporting this work. So um, we we love doing this. Our hearts are in it. We're going to do it either way, but we would yeah. appreciate your support. And we want to thank all of our donors who are currently supporting this ministry. So um but without further ado uh let's jump in to the topic of prayer um an area that uh we all know we need to grow in um uh, but that we often struggle with so yeah let, let's get started yeah well unfortunately for our listeners here sam and i have reached the heights of spiritual um enlightenment and uh and ecstasy and everything with god so you know because you can't give what you do not have and uh and since we both reached that um and of course i'm joking uh so i i actually am really I, grateful of, yeah <laughs> I'm, say, at, so. I'm at the level of infused <laughs> contemplation i don't know about you john but <laughs> That's yeah right. That's right. Yeah, mystical ecstasies and all. And uh, but since that's not the goal of prayer, we are fortunate to be able to discuss this uh, together because it's something that Sam and I have wrestled with, as have you, our listeners. And by the mere fact that you're clicking on this episode and listening, you know, shows a sign of grace that um, that you want to grow deeper in your prayer life and you want to understand it better. So. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about is that prayer is indispensable, as Sam kind of alluded to, in being a man and being a saint. And that's what we are all about here on The Catholic Gentleman, is prayer. And so we have unintentionally, maybe a little intentionally, have this Lenten series that we are uh, building up with. and, And we are talking about prayer, which is that unity with ourselves to God, right? We're reconciling and uniting ourselves to God. And when I started thinking about my own personal um, growth, let's say, in prayer, I think it's uh, in very much like a stock market graph that goes up and then goes down and then goes up and then goes down. And and hopefully over time, you see that it's growing, you know, about nine, 10 percent annually. But it's not the trend line of straight up is not how uh, my growth in prayer has been. And it has been a struggle and it's been a frustration, but it's been a joy and it's been um, beautiful and growing this habit and making this habit something that I consistently return to the font of life on a daily basis. And I hope that we can, you know, kind of share some of that wisdom, share some of the insights of the church and our faith with our listeners as we talk about some pitfalls and some difficulties that we have had to overcome when it comes to prayer. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, getting started, like, Let's let's talk about the different kinds of prayer because I think it's important to emphasize mm. that not 
uh, all prayers look exactly the same. Um, and, you know, as a Protestant, um, growing up, uh, we were basically taught only one kind of prayer, and that's vocal prayer, um, you know, where you basically have to carry on a conversation with God, you and it has to be fully spontaneous. Anything that's in any way scripted or that is a prayer that someone else wrote was considered illegitimate. So it's just something where you were just talking to God. And that can be a very beautiful experience. I don't want to discount that. Like, and yeah. the saints um, recommend vocal prayer uh, uh, throughout their writings and teachings. Um, and so it's very much a part of our tradition, too. Um, and, and so it's, but it's, I would hear sometimes people talk about like, well, and like an all night prayer vigil or something. And I'm like, how is that possible? Like, how is it possible to literally just talk? Uh. <laughs> Like what? What if at some point, like what do you what do you talk about? Like you made your yeah. petitions, you made your, you know, your intercessions. Maybe you praised God a little bit. You know, you, you, uh, uh, you know, like. But at some point, you're gonna run out of things to say, and then what? You know, and and there were really no alternatives in that Protestant tradition. Um, so let's talk about some of the other ways that that the saints talk about, um, in the way prayer can manifest in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And so that principal way that I like to talk about is mental prayer, right, which is that ultimate communion with God, right? And in fact, that's what prayer should be, is that face-to-face -face encounter with God. And while preparing for this episode, I started immediately thinking of the stark difference between the Catholic approach to prayer and, you know, Eastern religions such as Buddhism and things like that. And, and it just came really hitting me pretty strongly that that divide between the Catholic form of prayer, which is that intimate union with God, with the goal of perfection in God, but never losing ourselves. Right. So if we look at the Buddhist um, religion and things, we see that their forms of meditation and their forms of, of self-denial and everything are all there to assimilate themselves to this all, right? This universal all. And even to die to affections or um uh, uh connections to earthly people. And and then this this sort of universal all is is their goal and a dying to themselves. But for Catholics, our goal in prayer is to, yes, grow in holiness, but to grow into that intimate conversation and connection with Christ, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, enlightened by grace and brought to holiness in grace without ever losing our individual identity that he has given us as sons of of him. And so I just, I think, but how do we get to that mental prayer? And I'd like to start with the number one thing that I think is missing and honestly can can easily fall short when we pick up the writings of many of the spiritual fathers is that prayer and mental prayer and specifically that I'm speaking of here. And there's a lot of different forms of prayers that can help us get to that ultimate conversation with Christ. But mental prayer and specifically is 100 percent a grace from God. It is a total gift that God gives us out of his love. It is not something that we do and not something that we um, can provide a list of techniques to get there. And I think that's really important because with any technique, there are people that will naturally be really good at it and there are people that will struggle with it. But it is a gift from God also and I've had to reflect on this for many years because of my own pride or my own, you know, pick myself up on my bootstrap sort of personality. The, the realization that this is 100% a gift from God that he imparts upon us with his love and that we just have to work to create a fertile ground for, for this, the, the possibilities of this intimate union to actually happen was relieving for me because if it's not that, if it's a list of techniques, if it's a list of rules and orders that we must follow, um, it all depends on ourselves, right? It becomes dependent on ourselves or this other spiritual uh, director or things like that. So I like to start out and say that while we can understand 
um, techniques that can be helpful while we can understand the necessary conditions uh, to actually receive this gift from God. It is that 100% gift from God and, um, and that mental prayer, that actual conversation, that communion with Christ, with God, um, happens gradually over time if we persevere and we stay consistent. So I know I said a lot of different things there. That's where my mind was going when you brought up other forms of prayer. So, and there's currently rope prayer, obviously the rosary and, and these sort of things, but just that that ultimate end of of mental prayer being being the goal. And it, you know, it's mentioned in so many different ways by different spiritual authors. And and I know Teresa Avila has her seven dwellings and you're up and down, up and down, and you've got the purgative, you know, um, illuminative, illuminative and unitive way with other spiritual writers. So, but anyways, that ultimate goal, just kind of bringing it back, mental prayer and communion with Christ. So. Yeah. And I think too, like the, even the word mental prayer sometimes can be confusing mm -hmm, Sure, because we can think that it's, it's like thoughts. Like that's usually what we kind of associate with uh, the men, the, the mind or the mental space in the modern world where it's just thinking about something. So while well, I'm thinking about God, or maybe like I have a, a you know, there's a beautiful book of meditations um, um, for for every day. Um, oh man, my name is escaping me. It just, I, I've used it quite a bit, but the the name is escaping me right now. But it's where traditional Carmelite wrote it. Um, you know, and I think it was like the 1940s or 50s. But mm -hmm. um, but it's a beautiful book of of meditations for the liturgical year, and there's there's like thoughts to kind of stimulate prayer mm. but but to emphasize a mental prayer is not thinking about spiritual things good point it's not thinking about god it's not even like the the thoughts like directed towards god where you you know you're like kind of the opposite of vocal prayer just like internalized conversation with god although that's mm -hmm. part of it but i think the ultimate goal is is really uh, that that yeah that heart to heart union that you're talking about where um, everything tends towards that and even the word mentus in Latin doesn't mean mind mm. in the way that we think of it today in the Western world it's really talking about like this this intellect intellectus in Latin is like this capacity for knowing this capacity for you know and then in the ancient world there were different levels of knowing but the ultimate level of knowing was not like irrational knowing it was you know dianoia or union with what you know in love mm -hmm. like uh ultimately you become one like at the level of being with what you love and that's the ultimate form of knowledge mm -hmm. um and all other knowledge forms of knowledge are tending towards that ultimate form of knowledge and so same with prayer, where it's like, the, you know, vocal prayer, mental prayer, like, you know, like maybe sitting with a book of beautiful spiritual meditations stimulates your heart in a certain direction. And the more you meditate, the more you uh, or maybe it starts with thinking, maybe you're thinking about turning things over in your mind. But as you're doing that, like a, a spark, a, you know, a fire awakens in your heart and then that grows and grows. And ultimately, at some point, the thoughts cease mm. and you enter this level of like just intimate communion where you don't really have to say anything anymore. You don't really have to think anymore. You're just present to God and he's present to you. And and that's the ultimate goal. Like that's that's the ultimate goal. Um, and. You know, that can be something that, you know, like you said, is just kind of bestowed upon us. We can't manufacture it, mm -hmm. but we can kind of till the soil or prepare the soil of our heart for that experience to take place. Um, Eat. So, yeah, just just a little uh, nuance there with mental prayer, because I think the language is a little confusing sometimes. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with you. And, and I'm going to just speak to myself and then ask you the same sam is how frequently do you feel like you fall into that meditative communion and silence with god for me it's it's not frequent i mean i i bring myself to the the table so to speak every single day 
and like you know my um my go-to spiritual fathers of you know Dom Lorenzo Scupoli and St. Francis de Sales or modern day Father Jacques Philippe and stuff just constantly direct but at the same time you know it very much often falls into vocal prayer it falls into my very active prayer which is just that list of petitions thanksgiving and petitions that i go through and then uh i'll grab scripture or i'll grab some sort of devotional to try and uh, excite my mind and and excite my um my my emotions or or my um and not in a bad way but you know just my full person to to be uh focused on on god and to be open to that but very often that gift doesn't come because of a lot of pitfalls and issues that I, I currently work through. But that doesn't mean, you know, we we stop at that. So I guess I just I felt called with uh, the beauty of what you were speaking about and speaking to uh, to just kind of make sure that our listeners understand that, you know, it, it's not a daily occurrence for the majority of us, especially those living in the world with so many uh, different obligations and concerns and, um, you know, and uh, things we're doing to to better our lives. So just uh, what say you to that, Sam? <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think the, there's monks and nuns who literally like their job is to pray and they still find it a challenge and sometimes something that can take years to cultivate that deeper level um and and that's okay and i and i'll I'll add too that that our lord knows our weakness like he knows you know our our human frailty and that's why we have he he comes to us like in the beautiful gifts like adoration like i was just Mm. in adoration last night Mm. and it just hit me how beautiful it is that jesus just is just there you know whether or not you show up like that's really on you but he's there he's waiting and uh i love that story of saint john vianney like when he was um walked into his his parish church one day and there was just a farmer just sitting there looking at the eucharist and he's like what are you doing what are you talking about you come in here every day and you sit here for an hour what are you doing uh, what are you what are you and he's and the farmer just says I look at him and he looks at me <laughs> like, right. and that was it. And like, that was his entire prayer. Like he wasn't doing anything special. He wasn't doing any special exercises or techniques or anything like that. He was just in the Lord's presence. And that is a beautiful, and that was probably a very holy farmer or, or present or whatever he was, you know, where he uh, kept it so simple. And yet he was actually getting to the heart of what prayer is all about, yeah. which is just, being present to God and allowing God to be present to you um, and letting out everything else just kind of fade away for a time. Um, and so it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be hard. Uh, it can be kept very simple. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, I can't remember who said it, but one of the church fathers said, you know, like, let your prayer be completely simple um, because the, you know, the publican uh, was justified by a single word, you know? And so, I think that that while what we're talking about can seem very deep and very profound and it is, it's also very simple and accessible because our Lord knows that we're not all going to be, you know, Carmelites praying, you know, for multiple hours a day. Um, we have lives, we have families, um, yeah. we have obligations. Um, but at the same time, like like you said, making that space daily does till the soil for for those deeper deeper level yeah i would agree and and i i think that this is an excellent segue into um you know the the pitfalls uh that we as men face in prayer and growing in prayer and i think that one thing that just uh popped in my brain when you were talking was how on the last episode on fasting you talked about it being the use of our free will as an offering to God to choose fasting over the feelings of hunger and the natural instincts that we have. And I feel like that's exactly one of the messages we hope to get across within prayer here is that it is our free will choice to consistently persevere and return 
to prayer daily so that we can take and drink from the font of life, um, which is Christ. And, and that it's so important to, um, to remember that. And I, I think of, I believe it was St. Jose Maria Escriva who talked about when we fail, we must get up with holy stubbornness and just keep on moving forward. And as men, that's our job, right? Is to get up with holy stubbornness and to, to face this struggle uh, that's before us. And so while we go through pitfalls here, these aren't going to be perfect or pertain to everyone. Because I think that is one of the beauties of prayer is the fact that what works for some doesn't work for others. But we do have some, some you know, obvious things that as obvious as they might sound, no one's perfect and, and we still struggle with on a frequent basis. And so I like to immediately start talking about those physical distractions and um and how physical distractions can can truly keep us from actually praying or actually if we try and attempt to pray from staying focused and from growing and i'm not talking about the mental distractions and things like that but just literally the, your physical surroundings um when i would walk up and down uh the streets of new haven um it was hard to pray because there was so much going on, so much bustle, so much um, thoughts on the brain that uh, that it's it's it, there are times that are conducive and there's locations that are more conducive to this fertile ground again. And I like to bring this up. We are called to pray unceasingly. We are called to pray at all times, it says in Luke. And so there is beauty and there's the capability of praying throughout that but one of the things that can keep us from growing in that prayer is those physical distractions if we're not creating an environment for the possibility to grow in prayer there and by that i'm specifically thinking of do you have a prayer time a prayer location in your home that is um got doesn't have your cell phone by you that has a spiritual book that has good holy images, things like that, because we are incarnational beings. We have to be aware of that and not pretend like we can go from A to Z in the spiritual life just because we want to. So um, I, those are my initial thoughts when it comes to uh, physical distractions that can keep us from prayer and, uh, and things that we can do to remove those from our lives. And I, you know, I just encourage all our listeners to set up that location, that, that spot at home that you can return to that doesn't have um, a TV, that doesn't have your cell phone, that doesn't have a bunch of papers from work or things of that nature, but, but is, is a location and place that you can really develop that rich communication with God. Um, at least it gives you the opportunity. Yeah, no, yeah, I think you're 100% correct. And obviously the church knows this and why that's why our church buildings um, are, are structured and oriented in such a way, or at least should be. Some of them, yeah, yeah. Some of them aren't, but most of them <laughs> are designed to create an atmosphere of holiness, an atmosphere that raises your mind and heart upward. Um, and, you know, there's there's so many different beautiful images, statues, icons, things that we can draw from. But I also want to emphasize too, like don't discount uh, your physical being uh, mm -hmm. in prayer as well, mm -hmm. as you're kind of creating this prayerful atmosphere. You know, don't be, don't don't be afraid to light a candle or like light some incense or something that kind of takes you out of the ordinary existence mm -hmm. into a different dimension. But also, let's let's not forget things like posture or breathing yeah. or like, you know, and in, in counseling when we're often treating stress or anxiety or even depression or things like we often turn towards the, the physical being, um, you know, sometimes just sitting up straight can create a release of like tension that's pent up in your shoulders. You're like kind of hunching over, you know, your, your shoulders are locked up, you know, and you sit up straight and you let your shoulders drop. And you take a deep breath, and all of a sudden you're in a much calmer, uh, more present state. Um, and you know your nervous system responds, 
and you know you feel like a, a different level of peace and like i don't want to discount that you know like it's not everything but it is it is a key component in this so uh you know if you're if you're praying in a way that you know your body's crying out like with with tensions aches pains you got a headache like you know you're just uh you're breathing shallow and you're just your whole nervous system is in kind of this fight or flight uh stress response yeah. it's gonna be very very difficult mm -hmm. to attain you know a, a level of intimacy uh with god that you desire and um you know so don't be afraid to like even just take a few deep breaths from your diaphragm like to sit up straight to be aware of your posture you know how you're sitting and um those things aren't uh unimportant um yeah. and um just so pay attention to that you know corporal aspect of your being because the soul and the body are intimately intertwined and you ne neglect one it's going to affect the other um and so that can again just in addition to your physical atmosphere kind of till like prepare your heart for uh, this is, for silence and for prayer. This is so good, Sam. I'm glad that you mentioned this because I'm going to take it just one step further and talk about your posture throughout prayer. So for me, when I am trying to, as the spiritual fathers, you know, St. John of the Cross, St. Francis de Sales, Don Lorenzo Scapoli, these individuals all encourage is that you must place yourself in the presence of God. And I know that St. Francis de Sales has four different ways to do that. But one of the ways is I kneel down right at the beginning of my prayer time in the morning. I, um, I I specifically choose to kneel down as an outward sign of my inward humility and attempt and, you know, what I'm capable of doing to put myself in the presence of God. But I don't stay on my knees the full 30 minutes to an hour that I'm praying. And um because honestly, what you're saying, it becomes a distraction to me. My knees will start hurting. And while there is fruit in the suffering and things like that, that's not the point of my of my morning mental prayer is, is I've got my Thanksgiving, I've got my petitions, and then I'm trying to enter into that that loving communion with God. And and so if I stay on my knees for 30 minutes to an hour, which I have done many times in my life, but if I do that every morning, I would be I would be stressed. It would start adding tension. My mind uh, that would distract me <laughs> from from the right. point. And so, so I start with prayers. Sometimes I do that as well. Probably not as frequently as I should. But if I see myself just truly getting distracted mentally and struggling to stay focused, I will put myself back on my knees as that sign of posturing, as that sign of of directing myself towards uh, towards God and reminding myself of why I'm in this situation and doing that. And that struggle is very real. So I, I'm grateful for you bringing that up because that's such an important point. Yeah. And, I, and, 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 you know, like it just even like take your hands and just fold them, you know, mm -hmm. and just like, it just, it's funny. Like it just puts you in a different, I'm not saying you have to stay that way the whole time, but right. like just at the beginning of your prayer, just, it, uh, is there something about it that just changes your whole attitude and orientation and like, so these things matter. And I think, um, being aware of them, uh, can really make a difference in yeah. in your mental and, and and heart uh orientation or a posture or attitude inwardly um so it's it's yeah it's a key component of this yeah so i think another pitfall or obstacle that i've had to deal with and work through was the time of day that i devote to prayer and I know that there's this running theme, which uh, is that can we pray throughout the day? Absolutely. Can God anoint individuals to have deep and meaningful prayer, you know, at lunchtime, you know, while they're uh, transitioning from one activity to the next in the evening? Um, absolutely. Uh, those things are very possible for me. And um, and I think, you know, a guiding principle is is having that set, consistent time of prayer the majority of the time. And so for me, it's going to be in the morning. And I really do take to heart what uh, Francis de Sales really talks about is your mind is most um, agile, it's most uh, focused and, and less distracted early in the morning, right after you've gotten a good night's sleep, 
and you're capable of really trying to focus on these things. And that really helps. I know my temperament. I know when I try and wait until the end of the day, which I've done, and I've spent periods of time in my prayer life for this mental prayer and, and you know, periods of vocal prayer, I'm trying to do it in the evening. I can't let go of all that's happened throughout the day. And my mind come, immediately wanders to the past and what has just happened. And so um, I do think that one pitfall and one obstacle is kind of a sporadic nature or inconsistent um, time of day in which you devote to prayer time or maybe the wrong time of day for you devoting to prayer time. So I think that's an important point uh, for us to talk about. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we often want to use this tremendous effort or this like huge strength of will to uh, get our prayer life moving again. And so we like, we get, you know, our rosary out, we get some prayer books out. We're like doing all these things. Um, but really like the one thing that can replace huge exertions of effort is just like you saying, consistency, like rhythm, like every mm. morning before I do this, I do this. And that like consistent rhythm of just doing it day in and day out, even if it's a little at a time, cumulatively has a lot more benefit than all these fits and starts, even if those uh starts if you will like are hugely effortful you know mm -hmm. like we're, we're at the beginning of um lent still and when lent rolls around there's often this huge exertion of energy uh which then runs out um and we we we, we burn out very quickly so it's better to be calm stable consistent uh, even a little at a time, repeated over and over again, uh, day in and day out, will produce more fruit than those those huge efforts. Um, yeah, those huge uh, sprints that we often turn to when we're trying to kind of change our life. <laughs> That's uh, right. Which, which is it's understandable, but it's often less effective. Yeah, I really like that thought of rhythm, and you triggered something within me, and I can't. Can't remember who said it, but it, this idea that our life is a rhythm, our heartbeat is at rhythm, our breath is at rhythm, and our um, it was some some saint uh, commented and and stated that prayer should be the rhythm of our soul, and and that just follows right in line with what you're saying and how that consistency of time of day is so important to establishing that rhythm and honestly right the prayer life is growth in a prayer life you think about a marathon runner that individual who's running a marathon and running it faster and faster he didn't start there she didn't start there they started at the beginning where it was just let's see if i can get a mile in one jog right and then they grew from there but they had to be consistent right they didn't run a mile one day take two weeks off run two miles another day take three weeks off run a mile take a day off it was consistent it was that steady growth and thus is the life of prayer as well is that we have to be consistent we have to persevere with a purity of intention this kind of goes into that mental um, um obstacles with that purity of intention uh to our prayer life and i will say that if you wait until the end of the day to get your prayer time in one of the pitfalls or obstacles are going to be that you are tired that you prioritized a whole lot of other things um speaking from personal experience uh including leisure time that uh, took the place and so by the time you made the space for prayer you're already exhausted you're already tired and you're starting to fall asleep and so these are our natural concerns and things that can be avoided just by waking up plus i think about all these different you know, mental health coaches and uh, psychology coaches that talk about, you know, the 5 a.m. club, right? The things that you're capable of doing by waking up at a consistent time and at an earlier time are much greater than just staying up super late. So, you know, we've got science to back that. And um, and anyways, great. Yeah, last thing, I'll, last thing I'll add there is just it's not always possible. It really isn't. But if you're capable of it, of getting up before your family, like to just enjoy the those quiet moments, like there really is something incredibly beautiful and peaceful about the morning. 
uh, you know, even if uh, the world is still asleep, so to speak, you're, you know, your kids are still in bed and you have that quiet space, um, it, it can be a really beautiful experience. So if you can manage that, might be something to strive for, something mm-hmm. to build up to, um, to, yeah, get up at like 5 a.m. or something quite early. Uh, there's just a different atmosphere to the day than when there's all this hustle and bustle and maybe kids are getting ready for school or things like that, where it just, yeah. uh, it's a completely different experience. So, so yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. And I would say even the length of time is also important because if you get up at 530 and your kids wake up at 545, <laughs> that might not be the uh, the ideal. And the only reason I bring this up is because we have to set aside um, as men, I would I would suggest 30 minutes at least uh, of prayer time. Maybe you'll build up to that. But don't just say five minutes in the morning is going to be mental prayer, because five minutes is what we give somebody that we're looking to, you know, get away from and you know it, it's not it's not that time that we give to god so i do think that duration um it can be an obstacle if you are not planning appropriately yeah you know they they say that you know, like really can't even really enter a concentrated state i mean the better and the more you do it the better you get at it so mm-hmm. this, this is just kind of like for most of us the takes about 20 minutes to Mm. like shake off the cobwebs clear the mental clutter and really be present so like yeah i think 30 minutes is a great benchmark because you've had that 20 minutes you've kind of gotten in that prayerful prayerful state and then you can really you know and 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 you might need some some warm-up time so to speak with with some prayer books to guide you or like some some spiritual reading to kind of stimulate that careful state but regardless yeah i think 30 minutes is like kind of a minimum benchmark yeah Um, yeah so another obstacle kind of an emotional obstacle that i'd really like to talk about and hear your thoughts about sam is just that obstacle of despair and um and basically because you don't feel like you're progressing maybe you're three years in at 30 minutes a day and you just feel like it's the same as it was three years ago and you're led to despair you're um i know we've already talked about in this episode that it is a total gift from god a gift from a loving god and maybe we need to change our strategy or something but maybe you're despairing to the point and we get comments like this on our um on our blogs and shows and social media posts of like you know i prayed the rosary twice a day for five years and never felt any different and benefits so i just gave up or i I stopped doing it i guess they wouldn't say give up but i um you know I, i've tried praying for 30 minutes every morning and i feel like i'm just spending time reading for 30 minutes every morning i mean there's some deep issues and misunderstandings of prayer and things that can be used to help us grow from that but how do we avoid kind of a, an emotional depression or despair or just negative thinking when it comes to uh, this prayer time and this steady and long growth that it can often take to to enter into a, a deeper union with God. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think uh, there's a couple of things that could be said there. The first would be, what are your, a lot of it's expectations. Like, what are you expecting? If you are expecting, you know, St. Teresa of Avila uh, moments of, of yeah. ecstasy or like, you know, some of the great saints that we know who, um, you know, re- had these in profoundly direct experiences of God or like these they met their guardian angel or things like that. If those are your expectations, <laughs> you're almost certainly going to get disappointed because, yeah. you know, as we were, have, as we've kind of been saying over and over, like you can't manufacture those things. Mm. See, there's just no way. Um, and there was no guarantee that even as profound as St. Teresa's meditations were, Padre Pio's, you know, meditation were, things like that. There was no guarantee that they were ever going to have those experiences. Like it's pure grace at that point that if you do have those experiences, it's a, it's like, as you've been saying, a sheer gift. So, so manage your expectations. Uh, you know, what are you expecting to happen and often God hides our progress from us for the sake of humility. Mm-hmm. Um, if we are aware that we're we are growing, that God is 
is near to us. He, you know, his life is expanding in our soul and like we are advancing on the spiritual path. Oftentimes, the more aware of that you are, the more likely you are to fall into subtle pride or like self-satisfaction or really um, self-confidence to the point where you stop relying on God. And so God often hides our progress from us. And um, I think there's there's a purpose to that. And the other, the, but 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 that's not always the case. Sometimes you really aren't advancing. And then you, I think, the question to ask at that point is, um, why are you doing what you're doing? Mm. Um, like, what is the motivation there? And and I think we've mentioned this in previous episodes, but but you know, there comes a time when prayer can become an end in itself, or certain exercises or devotion can become ends in themselves. Like, well, I've been doing, you know, the nine first Fridays for, you know, three years. And like, you can come to think of it as like pressing a spiritual button on a vending machine where it's like, I do this and then God must respond in this way. And he's not, and I don't get it because I'm doing the thing uh, that I'm supposed to do and nothing's happening what is the point of that devotion? It's mm-hmm. to like the reason for all these devotions, like there's all these devotions, like the green scapular, or, like the brown scapular and mm-hmm. like, you know, the sacred heart devotion and you know, the first Fridays and like, and all of them have promises associated with them. But I, I truly believe like the more I've been countered devotions like that. Yeah. Because they're all different. They all have their own uniqueness to them. But the point is to, increase confidence like god knows how how weak we can be in our faith sometimes like you look at even at the gospels jesus was standing literally right in front of them yeah and the apostles still didn't see him they still didn't know fully who he was until after his resurrection and ascension like i mean they had got glimpses of it and you could see these moments where they they would they would get it for a second but then they would go back to their yeah. like their doubts, their weakness, their petty disagreements, and they would totally miss the point. And like God knows that. And so he wants to make it very concrete, very tangible for us. But the point is faith. Like he wants us to cultivate faith and trust and, you know, like surrender to him, to God's will. And like, so he knows we're like kind of children sometimes and he gives us these devotions. But if you're not growing in faith, if you're just, um treating it like you know you're manipulating god or like ultimately your will at the end of the day is still supreme yeah what yeah. you want is still the ultimate goal you're missing the point because they're they're ultimately supposed to move us beyond our will and our petty desires into the greater design that god has for us and that's what these devotions are designed to do but often we use it as an instrument of our own will yeah um and and that's the mistake so why are you doing these devotions like what is the point of praying two rosaries a day like that may be a very beautiful holy devotion driven by yeah by deep love of our lady and like you know a desire to grow in communion with our lord or it could be something very shallow that comes from a place of um manipulating god or wanting god to submit to our will rather yeah. than having us submit to God's will. Yeah, so one of the things that I was thinking about while you were talking was just this idea of kind of presuming on God, that God is going to deliver me or going to direct me or going to um, bring reality to my prayer life in this way. And and it was interesting because as you were saying, yeah, when those those situations as they come, and when we are led to despair, where we don't feel like we're going um, in holiness or growing in our prayer life and deepening our devotion can be such great opportunities for humility if we just reframe, you know, our thoughts. And I thought immediately of St. Teresa of Avila, where um, she stated that the edifice of all prayer is founded on humility. And this is this could be exactly it. It could be God working through you to like try and and break down your will, as you were saying, Sam, that there's this idea like it's it's ultimately dependent on my will. And that's honestly one of the biggest concerns about or um, you know, treating techniques to grow in mental prayer as the end in themselves, right? Because then it's still what I can control and not really dying to ourselves. You know, if you're prone to scrupulosity. 
I've seen a lot of this too, where, you know, the promise of the rosary or the promise of the brown scapular or these sort of things where you miss you miss a, a day of praying the rosary because of life circumstances or what have you, you immediately uh, just just feel like you've lost that whole promise, that, 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 that everything you were doing is gone. Instead of just saying, wow, that was unfortunate. Lord, please, by your grace alone, I can do nothing. And so, man, I certainly need your grace to even stay consistent with this beautiful devotion that I feel called to. And those are opportunities uh, that that are being presented to us. And we just kind of have to reframe them and, and, and view them, you know, in a different manner. And they can be just avenues for growth. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I agree completely. It's like what God wants is like, openness, confidence, trust, like very much like a child, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, unless you come from a, a, a you know, yeah, un tragic, you know, abusive home or background or something like that, most children just trust their parents. Like mm -hmm. there's going to be a roof over my head. There's going to be food in the refrigerator. You know, I can just trust that. I can just trust that God, my parents are going to provide for me. And I can live life with this this play, this freedom. I can just kind of enjoy the process, so to speak. Like yeah. that's really kind of how children are. Um, and um, what God is trying to do is we, we move into this adulthood where we move out of the trust and the openness and the joy and the freedom and even the playfulness, and we we enter the state of anxiety, discouragement, fear. We're like, we're analyzing, we're calculating, like you said, controlling. And God can't do anything with that. As long as we're trying to control our life, there's no room for God. Mm -hmm. There's no room for uh, something from kind of a higher level to enter the picture. Like we've, we're closed off. Yeah. And so, yes, if you, you're hitting the wall, so to speak, spiritually in your prayers and your devotions, that could very much be God trying to get through to you and saying, let go, stop trying to control this, stop trying to produce results. So I think the important thing is like effort, but detachment from results. Like yeah. if you put in the exertion, you, you say, I'm going to pray every day because I love God and I, I want to grow in love for him. And I'm going to stick with these devotions because that's what's driving me. And I, the results are God's matter. You know, the the fruit of that prayer is entirely in God's hands. But I'm going to show up every day out of love for him. Like that, God can do something with that. Yeah, that's so paradoxical, but so true. That's exactly right. And and I think that that's, that's what God is doing to us, right? The more that we humble ourselves, the better that we will be. And oftentimes we don't even realize those areas that we need to humble ourselves. And so God is, is doing that for us as long as we are consistently and, and, um, and persistently showing up, right? We just need to show up. So the last thing that I kind of wanted to talk about was just the most common one. And I don't know, we've been kind of talking about this, but the most common one is just distractions to prayer. You know, that oh, every single time I sit down, even if I do it in the morning, you know, I've got my coffee and, and immediately I start thinking about all the things I have to do and my mind starts wandering. And I just want to say, yes, you are human. And that is a reality. And actually, the, the moment you stop expecting distractions not to happen right are you start expecting distractions to happen um is is when you're going to start realizing how to improve and grow and manage those distractions as they occur so so when i come to prayer time i know because of years of of humbled experience that I'm going to be distracted in this prayer time, right? So I kind of already have that expectation when I go into it is that this distraction is going to happen. And what an opportunity, though, to use our free will to return ourselves to God, regardless of whether it was a two, three, four, five minute, you know, distractive rabbit, you know, hole that we went down. Um, you know, we we have that opportunity to bring ourselves back to God. And and that's that's meritorious. That's love. You know, that's that's beauty. And that is something that that God can utilize and, and those things are going to be there. So I do just want to bring up 
obviously everything that we're talking about of finding a consistent place and doing so, you know, without your phone and with, you know, um, sacred images and stuff can help with those things. But the mental distractions are still going to be there. What happened yesterday? What's going to happen to the rest of this day? The, the cloud of unknowing that's set forth before us every single day of our lives can be a distraction. And, and it's how we utilize that distraction that really um, dictates whether we are, are you know, growing in holiness or are we allowing it to kind of control us yeah exactly oh this this area is huge like and, and it's not i think a number one reason where why people give up because it just feels yeah. like a huge struggle against your own mind um and just a couple quick thoughts on that first of all yeah. um the the worst thing to do is to just fight those distractions head on because then they just get louder and louder. And so then that leaves the, the option of kind of ignoring them, letting them come and go like waves on the sea, like just yeah. letting them pass, you know? Um, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm having for dinner, you know, like, all right, just let it go. So yeah. Not a big deal. Um, and you know, a lot of, um, especially in Eastern Christianity and they have like the Jesus prayer of you know, Lord mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, have mercy me a sinner. Like a lot of the, the writers in that tradition are just very firm and consistent. Like just come back, just come back to the prayer. The second you see it, notice a distraction just let it go and come back to the prayer. And, and that's very practical advice. Just let it go, let it pass. Um, and then just come back. And again, the more you do this day in and day out, as we're talking about, I think the easier it'll get to just come back and it'll just become kind of like habitual. It'll just be something you just do. Uh, you just know how to do. The last thing I'll say is let's say something is, is coming up. That's maybe a little louder and more insistent and maybe a little deeper than some of the, uh, I have an itch or like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, the sun's in my eyes or like, you know, like uh, my kids screaming outside my door, or like, you know, whatever, like all those just, or even the thoughts of like paying the bills. Oh, did I, you know, did I take the trash to the curb? Is my, you know, all yeah. those are like more shallow distractions, I guess. Yeah. But what if there's something that's coming up that's a little more, uh, has a little more depth to it, is a little more insistent, like anxiety like something really profound, like I am just terrified about my future or I'm really worried about my kids or like, um, you know, or, or I'm just a sadness. Like I just noticed that whenever I start to tune out distractions, like I just get really sad or depressed or something like that. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes those are parts of us that are crying out for attention and turning towards those instead of ignoring them or going to war against them turning towards those things and maybe listening to them a little bit like mm. why am i sad when i get quiet maybe there is some like unresolved grief in my heart over a specific area or a loss or something in my life or maybe this anxiety is like so loud because it i'm not listening to it maybe i need yeah. to listen to its fears and like that can actually be fruitful in prayer too like Lord, I'm terrified about my finances or I'm terrified about my children's future or, or any number of things, you know, health conditions or whatever. Ignoring those fears would be a mistake. Uh, as, uh, so like you look at the Psalms, like it's all just David and his like inner life, like just plastered on the page, like everything, everything was That's okay. Right. You know, he even like was hating on his enemies and like saying, Lord, like, just kill them, wipe them off the map. Yeah. You know, he was sometimes like profound depths of grief, you know, moments of joy and just elation. Like it was all there. And I think that's why David, for all of his faults, was a man after God's own heart, because he yeah. knew what was in his heart and he knew how to bring it to God. And so all I have to say, like, if there is something deeper that just keeps coming up, don't ignore that. Like, mm. don't push that aside. Like, listen to that and bring that, incorporate that into your prayer. And it could, that could be hugely fruitful, I think. Yeah, I agree. Well, Tom, uh, Sam, anything else? Or is it time for uh, the quotes of the day? 
Well, that was all I had. <laughs> all right. So let's let's talk about quotes. So, uh, you know, very true to the Catholic gentleman, we like to bring up these uh, quotes of faith uh, that we can that are are sticking with us recently and, and hopefully they can stick with you. So um, I will start. I'll lead the way. I grab St. John of the Cross, right? One of the two doctors of prayer within our church, St. Teresa of Ireland, St. John of the Cross. And the quote that I grabbed for today was, he who avoids prayer is avoiding everything that is good. And that one really <laughs> that one really stuck with me. And I actually went through a handful of quotes, but this one in particular, I thought was a good ending one, is that I want to encourage our listeners to, to pray. I want to encourage you to persevere with holy stubbornness uh, in prayer, not forcing uh, results or foreseen changes, but being open and docile and loving to a God who is love and who wants you. And so, you know, St. John of the Cross uh, talks about that all good can come. Uh, we mentioned at the beginning of this episode that it's indispensable to be a, a, a man and to be a saint, to be a man of prayer. We have to have that um, in our lives. And so I thought, what better way to you know, bring it down and and drive it home as he who avoids prayer is avoiding everything that is good. Yeah, wow, that's powerful. Yeah, I love that. Um, for me, uh, there's so many, so many great quotes on prayer. It was kind of hard to narrow it down. But one that really like stood out to me was was one from a sixth century hermit with a great name. Mm -hmm. uh saint barsanufius <laughs> uh, uh i wouldn't recommend naming your kids after that it'll probably get made fun of but um but at any rate uh saint barsanufius says this about prayer i really love it um in times of affliction unceasingly call out to the merciful god in prayer the unceasing invocation of the name of god in prayer is a treatment for the soul which kills not only the passions, but their very operation. A doctor finds the necessary medicine, and it works in such a way that a sick, per sick person does not understand it. In just the same way, the name of God, when you call upon it, kills all the passions, although we don't know how this happens. Mm. So just cry out to God. Let his, you know, his name, his holy name, always be in your heart. And you'll notice you're starting to heal. Uh, and you won't even know how to explain it, but you'll just notice that something changes. So, Amen. That's the, the heart of faith that we all have in front of us. So thanks be to God for that. Well, thank you for joining us today. We're glad that you are here. Prayers for you during this Lent. And Sam, as we end each of our episodes. Be a man, be a saint. <laughs>